Good evening, UTS alumni. Welcome to tonight's Alumni Professional Development Series event, How to Plan for Your Dream Career. This event is exclusively for our newest UTS graduates, but we've also invited along final semester students as our soon-to-be alumni, so welcome students. We're happy to see you career planning early. I believe that great careers are not a matter of luck, so don't sit around and wait for luck. I'm Stephanie Rogers. I'm the alumni career coach here at UTS. I recently watched an awesome TED Talk called Why You Will Fail to Have a Great Career by Larry Smith, professor of economics at the University of Waterloo. Larry says he's seen excuse after excuse from his students over the years, and one particularly stood out to me, and I've also seen it in my recruitment background. It's this one. I want to have a great career. I want to follow my passion. And I have a strategy. It's the one that mommy and daddy told me. Mommy and daddy told me that if I work hard, I'll have a good career. So then if I work really, really hard, I must have a great dream career. Doesn't that mathematically make sense? No, do not fall for that trap. I guarantee you, if you want to work really, really hard, you will succeed. The world will allow you to work really, really hard, but that's not necessarily going to lead to a great career. So let's get career planning with tonight's industry-leading guest speakers. We've got three speakers for you tonight. We've got Brad Eisenhuth, co-founder of The Outperformer. That's a career management platform. He's going to share with us the strategy and techniques for career planning now. Then we've got Valeska Halpin. She is the founder of OneShot, which helps job seekers to secure their next role. She's going to use her extensive recruitment background to elaborate on Brad's strategy and give us practical tips that we could start using now. And then finally, we have a fellow UTS alumni, Camille Woods. She's also the founder of Monday Mind, and she's going to teach us how to get your first job and how to move from the corporate world to the startup space. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker to the stage, Brad. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much, Steph. And uh, thank you for everyone who's come tonight. It's uh, awesome to see people that are willing to brave the rain and invest in their career. And for me, I've uh, unfortunately had the luxury of had to, having to work with people in a lot of career pain through my uh, life. Uh, and through my consulting career and I don't like to see that so I really hope you take some uh, some tips out of today um, and that you get some value from the conversation I'm about to have with you. Unfortunately it's a really tight time frame that I've got to work with so I'm going to pack heaps of it uh, as much as I can into this conversation to make sure you get a lot of value out of it. Um, but of course, uh, when, uh, if there are any questions afterwards and we do run out of time, uh, I'm very happy to hang around and you can grab me and have a chat. Um, I'm pretty approachable, I'm not that bad. Um, so we're just talking, uh, the topic being driving a great career in times of change. First of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about the outperformer, just the five second on us and my, my career as well. Um, I've spelt, uh, spent over 12 years consulting particularly to the CFO space. Um, I worked in um, the recruitment space and have also done a lot of career management work with uh, both accountants moving through their career and, and uh, all the way through to the executive space. And I do a lot of work with uh, people going through different transitional changes and issues. Uh, and that's been through significant uh, periods of, of what we'll see in terms of environmental impacts on, on careers and, and organisations. So is anyone here work through, did anyone work through the GFC at all? Been a handful, makes me feel really old. Um, that was a very tough time for uh, many people losing jobs unexpectedly, organisational shifts had cr incredible impacts on individuals. I was actually, uh, at the time, uh, working with people through this transition and would often need to bring the tissues out. Uh, people worried about supporting their family, people worried about where that, what they were going to do next and those sorts of things. And I'm certainly not trying to put any fear in you, but um, what it, one of the realities of our career is two things, the environment changes and our own perspective changes. So life changes. Um, creating some career angst. Sometimes we get promotions, sometimes we're growing, sometimes we're really ambitious, we hit some roadblocks, we're moving forward, we're moving backwards, right? So there's a few things that I'm going to talk to you about today that will help you um, start to build what I'd call your version of success. Um, 
and create a framework that matters for you. They'll give you a framework that allows you to do some work that's meaningful for you and a career that's meaning, uh, that matters to you. So what is your version of success, right? So I can't define that. That's, that's, that's in your head. That's important for you to work out very, very quickly. Now, unfortunately, the, the, the point about careers and success and going through a journey, um, there's never really a destination, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to talk about the concept of clarity a little bit later, uh, and we will use destinations as a descriptor to what makes success, but reality is it's a lot more than just getting a job title and hitting the CEO role or becoming the head of product development or being whatever, right? Because you still want to wake up in the morning and love what you do. And I've met so many people with very big titles and very big salaries, right? Who come to me and say, Brad, this is not what I enjoy, right? And that's, and that's a reality. So it's not, not something for a lot of you that won't, won't hit that right now because you, you're in an early stage of career or you've just graduated and the world your oyster. But what I will say is what you can take of this today is not that negative impact, which is, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied, but building towards something that does satisfy you. So I, I, I'm not, because I am short of title, I normally would run a, not a little bit of a workshop where we get to engage with each other a little bit more, but I'm gonna give you one chance to talk, and this is now, and what I wanna uh, get you to do, just grab the person next to you, and I've given you two minutes, because I've got short time. And with that two minutes, I want you to talk about what you think would be stopping or slowing you from achieving your goals. Okay, so, and then that might be something you're working through now. Might be, you know, hey, this, there's uh, these things that are uh, impacting me and it's, it's making it difficult for me to achieve what I want to achieve, or it might be something you just think would be impactful, right? So just grab the person next to you, you've got two minutes, and I could be asking any of you a question, so be ready. Now, the boys at the front, I saw you having a good chat, so you get to tell me. So, <laughs> impediments or things slowing you down, what, what are you thinking about? Uh, we're at the last stage of our education, so I think something that really stops us is we don't have ex the exact clear idea of what we want to do, so we have no like exact broad expectations. Okay. So, uh, like so if you don't have a goal, you don't know where you're going. Yeah. Correct. So that's a good point. All right. Very good. So and so that's about for you clarity on what to do and, and where to go mm -hmm. and what what that version of success might even feel like because yeah. you don't know what it looks like, right? Yep. Okay. Yes. Time. Time. Why? You have so little, do you have little time? Very little time. What stops you? What's, what's impacting your time? I've taken, I've been involved in other schools where I've taken on a gap this year after the project. Yep. I know it's good for my career, but it's just so little time for like education and what actually drives your career a lot more as well. Yep. Just that, that just can't be taken off that. You're correctly, very correct. So it's about prioritization and using that time appropriately. Sorry. <laughs> I guess not being clear, I guess, on goals, um, but I've now had a career change that it's about the confidence to actually implement things that I want to know. And I yeah. Don't know. yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit, so how do I use the skills I've got? Yeah. And if I don't have many skills, how do I use that to move forward? Yeah. Yeah, cool. No problems. And one more. Yes, you're putting your head up to make it easy for me. Uh, when you have a job, yes. you want to go for another one. Yes. Grass is always greener. What am I missing out? What are the risks? Yeah, very good, very good. So awareness of what good looks like and whether it's right for you, right? Yeah, cool, cool, cool. cool. So there's some ideas, they're really common themes that will come up. And in fact, Valeska's going to talk a bit later about putting some rubber the road around um, some of these strategies. What I'm going to talk about is the high level technique or the framework that you should think through. And I wanna, when I work through this today, I want you to actually just go, OK, what does this matter to me? What does this mean to me? And how would I turn it into reality? But on this point, right, so I'm going to just talk to you about achieving goals. And when I, when I surveyed the community that I work with, which is a very large community, and to be fair, they've, a lot of them have got much more experience than you, but I'm going to at least give you perspective of how certain people think. Um, Right, this is really good for you to understand how people uh, feel their career's been impacted. So the first thing that people get worried about, and the highest result on our surveys is always that the employment market is an impediment. So lack of jobs, or not the right job for them, or I don't know where to get the job, right? Um, or, um, you know, the, there's, there's um, you know, I didn't know that job was available, those sorts of things, right? So employment market is perceived to be a, an impediment. The second is age. Has anyone here thought they were too, too young or too inexperienced for a job? Yep. 
So there's a lot of that, and there's also the other end of the spectrum, which is I'm too old and I can't get the job. And uh, to be fair, those biases do really exist out there, but, um, you know, and, and of course, that is, that is why it's uh, seen as an impediment. Recruiters, who's had issues with recruiters here? Who's been applying for jobs and getting the shits with them? <laughs> I used to be one, so don't worry, I can understand why. Um, but again, going back to the broader marketplace, this was a high result in terms of impediments. And the final piece was a lack of network. Right, so people not knowing how to tap into the network or not actually having a network to be able to utilise to find their next job or educate themselves on a job and those sorts of things. What was really interesting was the lowest results that we got in the market were on, two, uh, on three areas. Behaviour and drive, current technical skills and having unclear goals. So when you have a look at that, that's really unique and I'm really happy to see that people talked about having unclear goals because it is an important factor. But those are the things that people don't really prioritise or don't see as important when it comes to career management. Generally, this is later on in their career, so you guys are a bit early in your career, so unclear goals is really apparent. Right? But this is, this is a very broad spectrum of people. So I'm just going to take you through a case study to, to illustrate the point of career management and what it's all about. <laughs> And, and hopefully you start to see what I'm, what I'm uh, illustrating here today. So I'm going to, uh, this is a really easy case study for me to explain to you. Um, Jane and John, right, they're not their real names. If I give them the real names, that would be, be really that cool. But um, Jane and John are 37. They both started life as a chartered accountant or, or studied their CA. They went through an audit firm. Who here is working in the accounting field or finance field? Yep, okay, so anyone work in accounting firms, studying CA, anything like that? Yep, so. Um, the point of this is, this is, a, this is, the starting point is identical, right? Working in the same firm, in fact. Both of them early in their career said, look, I'd love to be a head of finance. Um, really important for me. I'd love to be a head of finance. This is where I'm going. So keep in mind, I've been able to watch these careers for 12 years and see how they progress. And lo and behold, Jane, you know, 10 or 12 years on, is the CFO of a large organisation. She's on $300,000 plus bonuses. But most importantly, she feels challenged, she feels engaged, she feels valued, right? So she loves her job. And, she's, and she actually is getting paid really well and she's got a great job and a big title and all that sort of stuff. Now, John, John's not doing too bad, he, he, but he said he wanted to be the CFO as well. He thought that was really important to him and, and that's how he measured his success at that time. Um, but, you know, 10 years on, he kind of stagnated. He be, was a finance major, which to be fair, is not a bad job, right? It's a good, good, well-paying job, 140 plus bonus. For most graduates, you would kill for that salary. Yeah, um, but at the end of the day, he felt he feels frustrated, he feels undervalued, he feels underutilized. Okay, and these are things when we when we look at our job, and I'm sure some of you are doing work where you go, "Geez, this is not cool. Um, I don't want to be doing this forever, and I want to move beyond that." Um, and so, unfortunately for him, that's how he feels. Whereas Jane, not. So let's have a look at the thought process behind this. What we really wanted to research was, was this luck or was it you know, deliberate decision making? Okay, did, did Jane just, just sort of wake up one day and she was, you know, she was the successful one so she gets all the gifts and gets the prize? The key difference that we found was there's a, there was a mindset difference, which was internal, we, we call it the internalizer versus the externalizer. I'm sure some of you have studied locus of Control. Does anyone know much about internalizers or the internal locus of control? Essentially, what that means is that I am, I am the master of my destiny. The environment around me um, is what it is, and I'm going to utilize my ability to make decisions with that environment. Whereas, what most people do in their career, and particularly as they move beyond uh, the graduate phase, is they start to get to a point where they um, they blame everyone else, right? The reason I'm not here is because my boss is an asshole, <laughs> right? Um, and they're stopping me getting a promotion. Or um, the market's terrible and therefore I have to go through all these job applications and it's all too hard, um, right? So there's that mindset is the dominant mindset we talked about in, that, in the survey. So I'm just gonna take you through this, this concept of managing your career, which I think is really, really cool. If you talk to a lot of um, people in their, their late 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, they wish they had this sort of mindset on this framework at this stage of their career. 
Right? They wish they, they, they want to, wanted to be able to plan ahead, but they didn't know how to, because mum and dad, going back to Steph's point, said, just work hard and you'll be right. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So, what does great career management look like? Can anyone tell me what the big smiley face means? You're happy, right? So you're happy, you're content, you enjoy what you're doing. It's a feeling, right? There's a massive, we're all human beings. So when you work, you need to feel engaged or feel positive and the environment that you're in creates that. And the way you look at it and the lens that you put to your career matters, right? So a great career manager, one of the things that we looked at is that they tend to be positive and tend to be excited about what they're doing. Doesn't mean that life doesn't get tough. There's a lot of shit things that happen at work. Apologies for swearing a few times, but that's just who I am. Um, next thing, what is that? Yes, exactly. So it's not a horseshoe, it's a magnet. Sorry, I was, my, 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 draw, my artwork is terrible. Um, but yeah, so it's a magnet. So it's about attraction. So great career managers attract opportunities, first of all. And the second thing that they are able to do, they attract opportunities that matter to them. That's, the, that's what the great you know, people that are managing their career really well is people know what they're looking for, they invest in them, they care about them, they trust them, and therefore they improve their chances of attracting opportunities. So instead of going to market, sometimes it just comes to their lap. That could be in their company, could be externally, but that is what, um, it's about creating that sort of destiny. And the, the final piece, the big dollar sign, Anyone know what that might mean? <laughs> you love money, you're all young, everyone loves money, right? So it's, it's, it's two things. Part of it is about being fairly rewarded and rewarded to a level that represents you know, that particular role or the nature of the work you're doing. The second component of it means that you feel valued. Right? So there are lots of people that, that are not in very high paying jobs but feel highly valued and they love what they do and therefore they feel engaged, they get up every morning and they're happy to go to work. Um, and this is, this is something that we need to take into account. So we've built this uh, model that's called CHIN, the CHIN system. I'm gonna go through this really fast because we don't have a lot of time. But there's four components that are consistent with the career management strategy and this is what I work with with all of my, my clients, both um, the, all the finance teams, they're primarily finance teams, but also individuals that I, I coach and work with. First is clarity. Second is high performance. We put the H in there because it's easy to say chin. Um, and influence and networks, take you through it. Okay, so clarity, what is clarity? So our friend over here talked about clarity from the point of view of not knowing where to go, and that's one part of it. And the second part of it is yourself. So that from a clarity point of view, we talk about internal clarity, which means you know, my self-awareness, do I know what I value? Do I know what's important to me? Do I know what makes me feel excited? Those things I talked about in terms of work. What stimulates me? What am I good at, right? So you, this is a foundational component about who you are. And for many of us early in our career, it's really hard to get that right because you haven't tested enough. You haven't seen enough. So you study, you study, you study, and then all of a sudden you're out working. But th there are ways to, to build that clarity, and we're gonna talk about that later. But one of the great ways to build that clarity is through mentors through networks, through talking to people and having the chance to test drive and having the chance to play. Think about all these things that you've learned over your life. You tend, to, you tend to get the touch and feel before you know how to use it. So careers early on, unfortunately, we have this big stigma of saying, you know, you've got to have consistency, you've got to work in the same organisation, you've got to build a brand, but at the same time, in order to define a brand, you actually have to trial. So it's this really challenging piece. But the sooner you can get that right and the sooner you can work that out, the better. The second part here is um, what we call the, the, what I'd call the career compass. So this comes back to what I'd call understanding what the, the destination looks like, right? So functionally and behaviourally, there's two components. Functionally, what do I actually do? And then behaviourally, how do I have to act to be successful in that role? Right, so, so someone here who, who might be a software engineer, they're coding or they're, you know, all right, you're in the detail, you've got to know, your, you've got to know a language, you've got to know it well, you've got to know how to execute very, very quickly. But at the same time, the behaviour for a successful developer may be, because you're ambitious, it might be that actually I don't want to code my whole life, this is my grounding, but I actually want to design and, and move into product design and move to a position where I can actually be uh, the person that uses my creative thinking. 
So you might be using a creative thinking in terms of the design of the, of the language and the way that it's, it's, it's utilised, or you could actually be applying in a different way. So thinking about that, what that behaviour looks like in terms of that destination. Performance. Okay, so um, in a company, who, who's working at the moment, like in, in, in organisation land and has graduated and all that sort of stuff? Okay. So what's a high performer look like? Can anyone describe it to me? Sort of up on the boards, I'm telling you anyway. Look, per performance is subjective. And you work this out over time in, in, as your career evolves. But performance is always in the eye of the beholder. So you've got all these people that are measuring how well you're doing. So the environment measures you, your manager me measures you, the stakeholders you influence measure you. So the key thing to think about for any of you that are moving into a role and thinking about, well, how do I get these people to care about me, invest in me? Well, you create value that matters to them. Right? So if someone wants things done on time, then do it on time. But there's a point where you need to, um, you need to think, well, I'm not necessarily going to stay in this role my entire life, so I've got to think about value in the, eye of the eyes of the next role or the future role or what I want to be down the track. How do I start designing that performance? How do I design that into my role now such that people say he's, he or she is ready? They're ready for that next move. They move up the ranks to get the promotion or get closer to that goal for yourself. Right, so the great thing about performers is they're not always the smartest, they're not always the most academic, but they're, but they're, a, they're able to manoeuvre very th quickly or well through an organisation because they're trusted. And it's a very, very common feature. So building trust through performance is the key. Influence, so I'm not going to go into this, it's a huge topic, we could talk about influence for like years. But there are two features of influence, actually three features of influence I'll talk about today. First is conveying your message. Now, Valeska is going to talk a little bit about the traction of actually going to market and looking for jobs. Conveying your message is about building your brand, so the presence, the way people see you, what, what they think of you before they even get to meet you. And then it's also about when you get the chance to articulate yourself, does that make an impact on that audience and do they actually want to go forward with you, right? It's a leadership principle. Am I going to follow your lead? The, second, the nice part about influence, if you start building influencing skills at this stage of your career, it's going to pay off huge dividends because no matter what you do, your ability to convey messages, you deal with people in every job. You know, for me in my business, right, I've got shareholders, I've got um, different stakeholders, different customers, right? I've got a team. All those people I'm influencing and they're all measuring how good I am at what I do. If I don't look after my team and I don't work with them, I don't influence them, um, to, to follow me and feel comfortable with me, then they'll leave and piss off and go and work for another company. And that's, that's exactly what you would do, right? So think about it from the lens of how you influence from that, point, that perspective. The final piece about influence, which m some of you may or may not be realising right now, is there's this internal influence which is really consistent with great career managers, which is built on two factors, resilience and mental toughness. So does, does anyone know the definition of the, or the difference between resilience and mental toughness? No? Okay, I'll just give you a really quick definition of both and you'll understand how it applies really quickly. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. It's your flexibility under times of adversity, right? So um, when there are times like the GFC or when the market goes tough or the organisation's under pressure or your role is about to be changed and you don't like it, you don't feel good, and you're anxious. It's that ability to bounce back and go, how do I look at this in a way that's easy for me to manage and move forward, okay? Mental toughness, the difference is there, is that is, that is actually about the ability to move forward under pressure and achieve a goal. So you might have seen um, the, you know, the golf championships and someone gets to the, the final putt the mentally tough person, if that's the final putt to put the, uh, put the game away, they put the ball in because they're focused on achievement, they're focused on getting what's important done. Sometimes under pressure, sometimes it's under really nasty environments. We talked about rolling out an ERP project and needing to all, all these other things to manage our career. The mentally tough person says, well, I've got to prioritise lots of things now and I understand it's tough, but if I really want this outcome, if it's important to me, then I'll do it. Now, if it's not important, then you won't do it. Don't worry, it's not, this is where the clarity piece comes into play. If, it's, if, clari if I'm very clear on my goals and I know what's important to me, then I'll do what it takes to get there. But if it's not important, then, then why would you? 
And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Just once you work out your value set and once you work out what's important to you, then you design a career around that. Okay, so I've talked about those things. And the final piece is networks. This is really important. The best part you can start doing now very early in career, most people fail to do this, is investing in their networks. Starts with friends, starts with people at university, starts with people in your first job, starts with your first boss. Right? So there's, if I looked at the marketplace that I work with, 63% of them believe they don't have a developed network. But if I was really honest, and once I get to know them, once they're under pressure, and once things go a little bit bad for them, then I'd argue that number goes to about 95% because the value of a network is actually to support you through and be that, they're the, they're the you know, we talked about attraction before, they are the mechanism for attraction. They actually give you the opportunity. There is not one job that is designed or given to you by a machine. Particularly as you, you, you go into corporate land and, and business land, right? So someone else is always making that decision. So there's that influence piece comes into a play. So there's two types of networks that you need to look at when you're, you're building your career. First is your internal network. So the company you're working in right now, am I, do I, am I connected? So do I know all the people around the place? Do they know who I am? You need to ask yourself that question. Do they value me? Do they see me as someone that gets things done? Relevant to that value prop, prop I mentioned before, right? So do they, do they think that I'm good at what I do? Now when you've got those two things going well for you, lo and behold, Hey John, here's a promotion. You want to have a conversation about that next phase of your career. Hey Jenny, right? So all this stuff starts to come to you. And then the next piece, right? So if I'm going well internally, I've also got to think about, well, there's a good chance that I uh, will one day leave. I also um, will not know all the answers. And to be fair, in lots of organizations, we don't have the answers. You know, I work in a very small business. I don't have, my team don't know everything. So my team and, me and I often have to call people to find answers and get things done. So the external network's about a few things. So you guys talked about lack of clarity and goals. The first thing a network can give you is perspective. Right, you want to know what it's like to work in this role? Come and sit down with me for a couple of days. Or come and sit down with me for a coffee. Let's talk about it. Um, support. So who's working here? Who's had a really tough day at work? No one. Wow, that's cool. Um, all right, cool. So when you have a tough day at work or when, you, when you're battling up some issues, sometimes to speak to a peer or speak to someone that is, uh, understands you, that understands your goals, that's invested in you and, and has a really objective you know, view of issues, they're great to speak to because it helps you through these, these sorts of journeys. And obviously, later on in life and when things get a lot more pressured, particularly when you are in these executive roles that I, and the people that I work with, they need that. Like there's high stakes on the line, there's a lot of pressure. They, they, you know, their definition of their whole life is usually their career for some people, and that's okay. But that's where support becomes important. And then the final piece is opportunity. So going back to my point before, having a strong network of people that believe in you and see and know, you know clearly what you're all about and what you're good at and what you're interested in, they're the sorts of people that think about things and help you and open doors for you. So they can be you know, different connectors, they could be advocates, they could be mentors, they could be all these sorts of things. Right, so I'm not going to go into complete detail on this tonight. You're very, very comfortable um, to grab me after this if you want to talk about it, but we've got limited time. But I wanted to make sure that you've got this sort of framework. When you've got all four, and I just want to mention this very, very quickly, when you've got all four in balance, it works really well. You'll find your career starts to go into places you like to see. But I'm just going to give you a really quick example. Let's say I take away clarity. All right? So I don't really know what I want. But really good at what I do, all these people around the place know me, and I'm actually really good at telling stories and influencing and getting everyone on board. Now what ends up happening, you, you know, pe people go, well, she's, yeah, she's pretty good, and that, but I don't, I, like, she doesn't even know what she wants. She doesn't know what she wants. I've been through interviews, I've seen some absolute stars that I've interviewed for my own team, and I just can't hire them because I can't trust they know what they want. So guess what happens? I just let them go because the last thing I want to do is invest the six months into that person and realise this, this is not their dream job. I want, I want them loyal to me. I want them to work with me. You know? um, and that's, that's really consistent. People, if they're going to invest in you, they want you to invest back. So clarity really helps. Let's think of this, right? You've got no network. Really know what you want to do. Really bloody good at what you do. 
and you know, go pretty well at the interview, but can't even get in front of the interview because no one knows who you are. Particularly when all, you know, 70 percent of jobs these days are found through networks, you've just cut this huge component of your opportunity away. So people you could be friends with that could trust you, you're not, not having these sorts of professional conversations, it breaks. So I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but think about that, right? And, and start overlaying that. And, and probably the thing I'd say for everyone to, in this room to start with is this clarity piece. So if I'm, if I'm working on clarity, right, these two next to each other work really, really well. The network. So find, if you, if you are unclear about where you're going, think about people that are in that environment. Valeska's going to talk about it, so I'm not going to steal the thunder, but think about people that are doing those things. Get the chance. They're, I'm telling you now, I work with some very, very experienced people. If they got a call or an email from someone who's a graduate and they said, look, I'm really interested in working in that industry or really interested in what you do, I just wouldn't mind a coffee because I'm trying to explore my career and my next journey and where I'm going, they are so cool about making time, right? You'd be so surprised. They actually like it because you know what? No one asks them because they're all afraid. <laughs> Who would be afraid? Right? Sometimes it's pretty, you know, it is quite confronting, but because it's different, it works. Right? And it's because that they feel that they're investing back in you and it's their value, that's, they feel proud about that, they'll give a bit back. So just a little idea to play with, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to introduce you to Valeska. Valeska is from OneShot um, and really, really um, valuable feedback uh, um, insight she's going to give you around the actual execution, like going to market, finding these jobs, going through the process of leveraging all of this stuff. Right, so thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. My name's Valeska, and I'm from OneShot. And I wanted to talk to you about my best hints and tips to help you best prepare and achieve your next role in your career. So my background is five years working for a large global recruitment agency. In that time, I interviewed thousands of job seekers and put forward a lot of those people to my clients. Something that was very apparent to me, though, was that although there were a lot of people that were really qualified in their fields and to do the jobs that they wanted, a lot of them fell down in the process to get those jobs because they weren't able to properly articulate, articulate themselves in interview or on paper. And what that meant was that they weren't as competitive when it came to selling themselves as other people. It was this imbalance in ability to do the job and ability to convince others that you can do the job that led me to create OneShot. And I work with people to help them achieve the jobs that they deserve, pretty much. So if you think of any touch point along the way of your job search, so your resume, cover letter, LinkedIn profile, interview skills, um, I work with clients to help perfect those so that they are able to perform at the best that they can to achieve the roles that they've worked really hard for. So a lot of people become paralysed by their unhappiness with their current reality. Who here thinks it makes sense to start prepping for your next job when you feel as though you want to get out of your current job? I've been guilty of this. A lot of people do, but if you think about the state of mind that puts you in, it's a state of flight and you're wanting to escape pain and you're not able to have the same approach to your job search if you did as though you were happy in your job. You've got a sense of pressure on you to, uh, to find a job and get out of where you are currently. Um, so the key to this is anticipating. So imagine how much better you would be if you had started to think about this six months or 12 months in advance, you would be able to get your head around exactly what you wanted. You'd be able to apply the chin approach and you would be um, very proactive rather than reactive and resulting in you being a lot more competitive compared to the other candidates. If you fail to prepare, then prepare to fail. We've all heard that, or as I like to put it, if you prepare, you will succeed. So that's why I want to talk to you through some of my best hints and tips to help you succeed, achieve your next role. 
So getting a bit more practical from what Brad mentioned around his chin approach. So to prepare in advance, think about what your next career moves will be. So research these internally. Is it going to be a promotion in your team, a secondment or a project, or is it going to be a lateral move to another team? Map these out in advance so you know exactly what exists and the reality that you might achieve one of them. At the same time, build your network, both internally and externally. So Brad mentioned that this is a very good move when it comes to your career network long term, um, and also when it comes to doing your own research. So I say build your network internally so that you know the types of roles that exist down to a, down to a really good level of detail. So if there's somebody doing a job and you go, oh, I wonder what that's like, or I might want to do that, go have a coffee with them. And externally, it's fantastic for you to explore exactly the types of roles that you want to do, or perhaps the types of roles you want to avoid. Um, when it comes to your job search, these conversations are going to be your advantage in an interview. When you're speaking with a company and they ask you, why are you here for this role? You know exactly why, and you've got such great knowledge and research behind you that you can bring that across in interview. Um, so yes, that's it for externally as well. So a few things to consider when you're in that six to 12 month period is, what will make you more competitive? So by having these conversations internally and externally, you will get an understanding as to what your gaps are. So if they say we need somebody with this skill set or you know, this would be ideal for this role, you know exactly what you need to improve in that time frame. You're not waiting for that moment of pain before you wish that you had done that. Um, and develop a portfolio. So it won't be appropriate for everyone, but start to think about what you will include in your portfolio so that you can showcase that in an interview. Also, right now, you need to start thinking about why you would look to leave. It might be a bit counterintuitive, especially if you are happy in your role, but you need to know what your core motivation for looking to leave is, um, because when you're challenged on with opportunities or other offers that might come along that you hadn't thought about, it all comes back to you knowing exactly why you want to move. For example, it could be salary, it could be a more challenging role, your personal situation may have changed and you might need to relocate to a job closer to home. So it helps you avoid um, dangling carrots. So now that we've talked about some initial things that you need to do six or 12 months out, I want to talk to you about what you need to do to prepare yourself properly when it comes closer to your job search. So if you think about your product, it's yourself. So I call it going to market because you're taking yourself out to the market. You're going to have a marketing toolkit. You're going to consider your channels. And you're going to consider one of the major stakeholders in all of this, your current employer. So I'm going to give you some top tips across all of these. So your marketing tools consist of all the major touch points that I mentioned before. Resume, cover letter, LinkedIn profile, and business plan. Don't leave these until the last minute. They, although they might only be one or two pages, they require a lot more work to be competitive. So your first tool is your resume. So this needs to be achievement oriented. I have seen a lot of resumes where somebody has literally copy pasted their job description to their resume. How do you think that looks to an employer? It's really obvious, by the way. It's not achievement oriented and it probably says more about their work ethic than anything else. Um, it, if, you, if you think, oh, I don't have anything, I, I've not won an award or I don't have anything to put on there that's an achievement, just think about what contributions you've made, what projects you've taken on and what impact you've had on the business and try and t make that tangible and put that on your resume because it's those outcomes that are going to differentiate you to other candidates. Don't be ambiguous on your resume. So if you say that you've achieved growth with something, put a percentage. If you say that you've worked with clients, include what industry or the size businesses that they were 
The more detail you can provide and the less ambiguous you are, the more the reader of your resume is going to be able to understand what you've done. Don't make it too hard for them. And also if you've worked for a small business that may not be known to the company you're going for, include a one-liner as to that organisation. Customise your resume. So you've all heard about customising your cover letter. When it comes to the roles that you're going for, make sure anything you include under each of your roles is relevant for the, that particular role, otherwise it's a waste of space. Um, sometimes you'll reorder them, sometimes you'll remove them completely. So I know that when I went for jobs, I had about three different versions of my resume, all of which I would tweak to each company. Um, and keep it succinct. So you want your resume to remain really punchy to the reader and you want them to really understand what you've done, so don't put any unnecessary information in there. With your cover letter, highly customise this. So because you have done all of this background research, you know exactly what your own motivations are um, and this should be really easy for you to include in a cover letter. A company doesn't want you to put copy-paste, copy-paste of company name and role title. It is really obvious. Um, so you need to have more around your why you want to work for that business, why you want to contribute to them. Um, it's not all about what you can gain. And link your skills. So get the job ad, get your cover letter, and look at the key skills that they're looking for. And of those which you possess and can provide evidence of in an interview, weave those throughout your cover letter. The person knows what they're looking for, and they will be nodding as they read your cover letter and they'll be able to see, okay, we know why this person really wants this job and will be a good person for us to interview. So now on to your LinkedIn profile. So some top tips for this one is optimise your LinkedIn profile. What this means is include keywords that companies or recruiters might use to search so that you come up in their search. So if you're in marketing, Digital marketing, include key industry terms that you think they might search for. Candidate on feature allows you to be found. You can put your own criteria to this so that only companies, so with a part-time role for example, will find you if you're looking for a part-time role and you will only be contacted about relevant opportunities. And connections as well. Don't just connect with everyone, that will dilute the quality of your network. But do, if you're meeting somebody in person and you want to continue that relationship, you want to nurture that relationship, send them a connection and stay in touch that way. And get some recommendations as well. If you've done some good work for somebody, a client or an, an old manager, get them to write you a recommendation as well. So they're my top tips for having an outstanding LinkedIn profile. Employers will check it out. If your name gets across their desk before your resume, they are going to be stalking you. This one isn't something you will do in advance, but you should start to think about what framework you will develop. Because if you get an interview, I highly encourage you to do a business plan, or as Brad calls it, a success plan. Um, and this is going to separate you from other job seekers in an interview situation. And what it involves is you outlining, say just a plan on a page and no more, your understanding of the status quo and where the company is at, what they want to achieve, what their vision is, what the opportunities and goals are that you see, and what you would do if you got the role. In this, you're not going to know all the answers. It's okay for there to be X percent and Y percent and be ambiguous with what you've got on your business plan. And what that allows you to do is turn that into interview questions. So when you're in an interview and they say, do you have any questions? You can say, I noticed based on your strategy that there was this opportunity. Have you thought about doing this or what is your plan in this situation? Um, so that your questions aren't, tell me about your culture or what's the salary? Um, but they're really well thought out, researched questions that come from all of the research that you've done. And as I said before, having those initial research interviews 
of research catch-ups, they will give you their primary research and they'll give you so much more knowledge when it comes to meeting with organisations and understanding the role at the nitty-gritty level. So going to market, we've talked about developing your marketing tools to develop you, to market you, the product, and now I want to talk about channels. So you can go direct and you can be proactive. This is building on what Brad mentioned before around your networks. So those people that you were having those coffee catch-ups with, suddenly they are your referral network and they might not have a job for you but they might know somebody who will. Reactive. This is applying for the job boards. This is looking for companies that have put word out to the market that they want somebody. Um, this is obviously a very popular way of going about your job search, but it is highly competitive. And unfortunately, some good candidates do get overlooked. Recruitment agencies. So this way, who here has used a recruitment agency before? Yeah, so a recruiter will be able to represent you to their clients. A benefit of using a recruitment agency is that they'll be able to tell you all of the finite details up front about the job that it, it might not be appropriate to ask an employer. You know you wanted to know if they have parking because you really want to drive or you want to know what the money is. Um, using a recruiter will be able to uh, represent you as well as answer all your questions. Um, and also they can help negotiate you the salary that you want. So another stakeholder I wanted to discuss with you, because I don't hear this discussed much at all, but it's your current employer. Um, and this, working in a recruitment agency, there was a lot of discussions that I would have with job seekers that helped them manage their current employer as a stakeholder. So the first one is confidentiality. You might be best friends with your manager. Do you tell them that you're looking for a job? The easy answer is keep it confidential. You might think that you can tell them because they're your friend, but what if they have an obligation to tell their manager or they now have to start thinking in the back of their mind, well, if they're looking to leave, then you know, I need to start thinking of, of replacing them. Um, the dynamic can shift and it might, you, you don't want to put them in a compromising position either. So the easy answer is keep it confidential. My second tip for you all is don't resign until you resign. A verbal offer isn't an offer. Wait until you've got the contract before you hand your notice in. I know a situation where there was a job seeker that had a verbal offer. He was so excited, he resigned. The company he was going to next day announced a national recruitment freeze and he was not given a contract and he was left without a job. It's a very sad situation. Um, but these things can be avoided. The last one I wanted to discuss with you is counter offers. So this is where you'll go to resign and a company will turn around, the, your company will turn around and say, don't leave us, you know, stay, we'll give you X. Now for some people that haven't done all that initial thinking of why they're looking to leave, this could be very difficult. But if you already know what your key drivers are, you already know that it's a challenging role you want or more money or a job closer to home, you're not going to be deterred or distracted by other attractive possibilities because you know your why. And if you ignore this and you take perhaps a counter offer that is more money but to stay in the same job, then you'll tumble back down your Maslow's hierarchy of needs and be dissatisfied and be looking back in the job market again in a few months' time. So I hope that I've given you a few practical hints and tips to apply to your job search that are going to enable you to become very happy and satisfied in the long term. So what next? Forecast your internal opportunities so that you know what you can aim for. Map your, next, map your potential move externally so that you've got some alternatives should nothing come up internally or you have something to compare it to. And thirdly, prepare your marketing tools in advance. Um, and if you want somebody to look over your resume, I'm happy to do a free resume appraisal um, and give you some feedback before you go to market. Feel free to connect with me as well on social media. Um, and when the time comes, if it not be now, 
um, shoot me a note if you want me to have a look over your resume. And I'll now pass it to Camille, who's going to talk about her transition from corporate world to startup world. Hi everyone, I'm Camille. Um, and like you, I chose the best university in the world, UTS. Um, so your dream career is within reach. I didn't make long service leave. Um, I went to UTS and I did a Bachelor of Accounting. Then I got my CA. I worked in construction as a graduate accountant. And um, the GFC happened. And constructing, um, construction wasn't a great place to be because you know, you know the economic cycles. So I moved over to Sydney Ports. Uh, Sydney Ports was going really, really well at the time. It's still, well actually it's been taken over, but um, Sydney Ports was really fun, beautiful, great big containers, and it was like a mystery what was inside the trade containers. It was like unwrapping an Easter egg. I got to see all the trade, um, all the trading and what was happening. There's actually a whole bunch of paper that gets imported and exported in and out of Australia. So I was learning heaps of different things in Sydney ports and I thought, what's going well? I'm sick of things um, not going well. A lot of my friends got made redundant. We were young. We still are young. Um, and I thought, this is annoying. Companies are just going under. I had friends who were in their graduate jobs getting made redundant. And so I thought, what does Australia do well? By the way, the London uh, market was flat as a pancake. So the dream is, the CA dream is you, then you go off to London. But due to timing, it wasn't really an option for me. So instead of London, I moved to Brisbane, which is just as fun. And I was a mining accountant in Brisbane. Dirty coal mining, um, so judge me. And um, <laughs> honestly, mining was quite fun. I love things that I can't fully understand, like engineering and construction, ports. I love really big things where you, you don't know what's going on, but you're uncovering a little bit, piece by piece. So I really like learning, and especially things that I can never hope to understand. And so mining really suited me. It was rough, there was a lot of swearing. I'd often get phone calls and just so much swearing. I learned a lot of new rude words. <laughs> and then mining, boom, turned to bust. And um, it was really sad. Things used to be um, full of hope, everyone was excited, Friday night drinks. And um, everyone would talk about cubs, cashed up bogans. And mining was fun, and then all of a sudden it went bad in the bust. And so um, then I moved into startups and academia, which is what I'm currently doing. So I kind of have two jobs. I have a startup and I also teach accounting at Macquarie University and UTS. So I'm back teaching the subjects that I learnt. Um, so that's my story. Uh, this is not my piece of advice. This is an advice that I heard from another networking event. And it's about the drama triangle. Basically, this is you, the victim, who's got a really sad story, you take your friend, who's your hero, to coffee. And then you talk about the villain, your boss, because your boss is making you do work. And then you do this every single day with your favorite coffee friend, and you repeat, repeat, repeat. And I love complaining, but here's a different way. So instead of being known as being the drama queen, talking about this terrible work you have to do, Here's another way where you do it. And down the bottom, instead of having the villain, the boss, it's a challenger. And this really works. Um, I've had some bad managers for sure. And instead of thinking, oh gosh, I hate them. I can't wait to tell the new story. Um, oh, I'm going to ring up my mum and tell her all about it. Instead of thinking like that, even my mum got sick of me complaining. She's like, don't think of them um, as someone bad. Think of them as a challenger. They're making you stronger. Uh, each knockback you have, you're getting stronger and stronger and you're learning heaps more new skills. Stop thinking of them as a bad thing. Uh, even in boxing, you, you're punching someone, you're getting stronger and stronger and it's just giving you more and more skills. And um, so then you're also thinking of your friend as a coach or someone who's really good at their job. You know, in a dream career, you're going to have a lot of bad emotions. So in this emotional wheel, which is great, it gives you so many different synonyms instead of being happy, sad, there's a whole bunch of really interesting words. Half of the circle is bad emotions, the other half are happy emotions, and during your career you're going to be bouncing back and forth all the time. 
But you want to maintain a level of professionalism. You want to look like a doer. So sometimes you've got to um, not be such a drama queen. OK, this is what you think of your job. This is someone who wants your job, thinks of your job. They've just put a different filter on. So if you're ever thinking you're, that your job's not great or you don't like it, uh, interview someone. And you're going to be sitting across from the table. They want your job. You're going to start saying how amazing the company is and this role is very challenging, is very important. And you start to believe your own hype. And I've seen this happen a lot. People come out of interviews and they come back to their desk and they just, they've got the job. And there's people out there who really want your job and it's a dream career to them. So instead of complaining all the time, think about how great your job is. Um, it's not so bad. So less drama, more doing. That's what you want your image to be. A problem solver. So when you have a question to your boss, you want to have a possible solution. Otherwise, you're just always going over to your boss. Oh, what should I do with this? What should I do with that? Uh, how do you do this? What's going on? And then when the boss sees you, they're like, oh, go away. Stop asking me stuff. So you want to have a few solutions. They might be wrong. Most of my solutions were not great ideas, but at least I'm trying to think of some solutions. And at least I've got uh, a, a bit of some crazy ideas of doing something. This second one's not my advice either. This is from my ex-boyfriend. Um, there's enough room in the world for everyone. So I started my company, Monday Mind, which is a corporate yoga and meditation company, quite different to accounting. And I thought, um, I think there's enough yoga places around. And I thought, I don't know, is this even a good idea? But then I remembered there's enough room in the world and um, you don't have to be amazing at something. You just have to bring your passion or whatever you, you really enjoy and then match it to what customers are looking for as well. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'm not even good enough. Maybe I'm not even good at meditation or good at yoga. And here's a photo shoot we had and I can't do that and I'm the yoga teacher. But um, other people's success is just their success. That's got nothing to do with me. So when you looked at LinkedIn and you see your classmates, like I've got alumni, and I, you can't defriend on LinkedIn. So I, I see their careers. I know it's good. Um, but that doesn't mean anything about me. That just means their careers are going great. So um, instead of always making everything about you, you want to celebrate other people's success. And that's something that I've really enjoyed as a teacher when I'm teaching accounting. I just really love it when my students get graduate jobs. Really, really excited for them. The next one is to surround yourself. I only have three pieces of advice. That's the last one. And they're not from me. Um, so I wanted to get into yoga. So I found heaps of yoga friends. And you've got to surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do next. Because you need to start, uh, when you're doing a career transition, you have to imagine yourself if you just keep imagining yourself being that new career, um, sometimes you don't, you don't fool yourself. You need to get friends who are actually doing it because they can, uh, you'll start to absorb just from having fun conversations, you'll start to absorb the realities and then you're seeing what they're doing next. So it's, it's so much better. Once I start hanging around with entrepreneur friends, then there wasn't such a big link. Because you read articles about entrepreneurship and it's like Steve Jobs, um, Mark Zuckerberg and all these amazing people and they're like top four tips. And you think, yeah, that's cool, but um, you know, how am I going to make that big jump? So you need friends that are, are doing it step by step. This is, uh, I think also for career transition, you need to get out of the office to think about your next career. Otherwise, you're going to be thinking about the person next to you and their job, and you're going to be kind of always thinking about only in your little office. I think you need to travel or get out and um, see some other offices and stuff, so you're not too small. So um, this is in New York. This is a meditation class, um, and it was on a boat with 2,000 people. So I would never have thought of having meditation on a boat with 2,000 people had I not gone on a little um, on a holiday. And then I thought, wow, that's New York. Like, of course, you can get 2,000 people on a boat meditating. There's a huge population. Then I thought, in Sydney, um, how am I going to get a bunch of people together for something, something fun? 
And so this is not the first event, this is the second event. The first event I had was a beta test and it was low budget. I invited five people, five people came. Success, five out of five. Yeah, so, and then, thank you. And then I thought, um, oh yeah, five out of five. Not great, not great. But at least people showed up and then this is the second one. And this, the night before the second one, I just couldn't sleep. I was like, how embarrassing. I've made like a, a yoga rave party. You can't have a party with five people. Last time five people came. And I just was beside myself, but anyway, it happened. Um, there's UTS Hatchery Plus. So if you want to surround yourself with other people who are trying new things, not scared about failing. Um, I know how scary failing is, especially when you're bold and you, you're telling everyone, guys, come, come. And um, it's just, you feel really scared that not only have you kissed your last career goodbye, but you're embarrassing yourself in front of your friends. That's why you need your entrepreneur friends who are like, no way, man, that was heaps cool. <laughs> you really need them and they need you. And at UTS Hatchery, you can um, go to lots of different events. Um, you can talk to me about it too. So I'll put my email on. Um, so yeah, you can ask me any event, uh, anything about that I've talked about today or about Hatchery as well. So Hatchery is at UTS and it's all about developing your business and um, there's lots of different options there as well. So thanks for coming and there's food. Oh, and Steph. Thanks, Steph. Please join me in thanking our awesome speakers for sharing their insights with us tonight, all three of them, Brad, Valeska, and Camille. Busy people appreciate their time. And we'd like to invite you to continue the conversation with us outside. We've got some more yummy food, we've got some alcoholic beverages for you, and I'd also like to thank the Chartered Accountants, Australia and New Zealand, for sharing this lovely space with us this evening. We look forward to hopefully seeing you at our next alumni professional development event, and feel free to talk to me outside as well about our alumni career services. Thanks for joining us and checking through the rain tonight, everyone. Thank you.